Welcome everyone to uh, the second and final day of the uh, 11th annual Upstate New York Number Theory Conference. Um, I mentioned this yesterday, but I want to mention it again that funding, uh, this, this conference could not have happened without funding from uh, the NSF and also the Journal of Number Theory. Um, and again, as I mentioned yesterday, the primary goal of the conference is to bring together specialists from various branches of number theory in upstate uh, New York region and, and the surrounding area, and to expose uh, younger researchers to new and old problems. And I'm hoping that it's achieving uh, that effect. And so, um, you know, for the uh, younger crowd out there, please feel free to, you know, to reach out to the speakers, ask them uh, questions, um, maybe, um, you know, explain uh, in more detail what uh, what problems they're working on, and so forth. Uh, so today we have uh, two plenary talks um, um, uh, by Steve and Alina, um, and then one parallel session. And so after this talk, we'll head over to Highland for the parallel session. Um, uh, after this talk, as we're walking over there, I'd like to get a group photo. Um, somewhere in the grass right over here as we're walking over. Um, as always, if you have any questions at all or concerns, uh, feel free to ask me, uh, Doug, or any of the other organizers uh, that are here. Uh, with that, it's my, it's my pleasure to introduce our first uh, speaker, uh, Steve Miller uh, from Williams. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, cat uh, density and, and central point. And so thank you. Um, I think we have, three editors for the Journal of Number Theory here at a minimum today. And so especially for those of you who are younger uh, researchers, if you do have some papers that you think are appropriate, please feel free to send it to us and we're happy to give you a quick assessment and try to make sure it's refereed quickly. We understand that when you're young and you're on the job market, your turnaround time is extremely important. So what I want to do today is I want to give a very accessible talk since this is the first talk of the session and it's right after a nice long party the night before. I don't want to have too many long calculations. Um, I do know one of my former professors is here. And so if necessary, I will show the five pages of complex contour integrals with the pole on the line of contour to show you that you did do a good job teaching me. This can all be done. But I really want to just focus on high level what's going on. So this is meant to be an introduction to the subject. If anybody is interested in looking at any of these problems further, I do a lot of mentoring both with you know, students in the standard RU program that's headquartered at Williams, but also in an online program. And so if any of you want some experience in mentoring students and research, please reach out to me. There's a lot of uh, things we can talk about. This is a continuation of a talk that I think I gave the last time I saw you in Rochester in 2006. So if your memory is really good, which based on some of the stories you were sharing last night, I think it is. Uh, you will probably recognize a lot of the slides in the beginning, but hopefully as we get further down, you'll see some things that are new. All right, so what I wanna do is talk a little bit about why do we care about studying zeros of L functions? What kind of problems can they help us uh, understand? So here's a couple. You know, the first is the infinitude of primes or primes in arithmetic progression. The next is Chebyshev's bias that most of the time and most can be quantified, there seem to be more primes can go into three mod four than one mod four. Uh, for those of you who like elliptic curves, there's the Birch and Swinton diet conjecture that the group of rational solutions, the you know, uh, geometric rank of that seems to equal the analytic rank of the associated L function. And then you can also have some results about the class number. And it turns out that for a lot of these problems, the more you know about the zeros, the more you can say. So if you just care about the infinitude of primes or primes in arithmetic progression, it's enough to know that the zeta function or more general Dirichlet L functions don't have a zero on the line, real part of S equals one. If you wanna start talking about what the error terms are, then you need to know a little bit more. That's where the generalized Riemann hypothesis uh, comes into play. If you wanna talk about Chebyshev's bias, the prevalence of primes for the most part, three mod four over one mod four, you need the grand simplicity hypothesis. Out of curiosity, how many people have heard of the grand simplicity hypothesis? Hi. As the speaker, I probably should be raising my hand right now. So it basically says, if you take, say, a Dirichlet L function and you look at the imaginary parts of the zeros, because of course they satisfy the Riemann hypothesis, this goes beyond that, then the imaginary parts are all linearly independent over Q because how else could they be? You know, how could you have a rational relationship among them? So a very reasonable statement, and it allows you to say that a certain flow on a hyperdimensional torus, you know, flows uniformly and hits everything. 
But you know, again, these are things way beyond what we are going to be able to prove in the near future. And then the last one on the class number, it turns out if a lot of the zeros, a positive percent of the zeros are closer than the average spacing, it turns out that uh, work of Connery and Ivanya show that that's related to good bounds on the class number. You know, it is of course possible I could give you a sequence of numbers where everything is the unit you know, spacing to the next one. But most of the time we would expect sometimes you'd be a little bit closer, sometimes you'd be a little bit further. So anyways, there's a lot of problems that are related to zeros of L functions. And they're great ways of encoding information about things we care about. And so what I wanna to do today is talk a little bit about what is the correct scale to study a variety of problems. And to try to keep the talk accessible, I will concentrate on random matrices and I will concentrate on Dirichlet L functions. And I'm going to make the assumption either that you've already learned about cuspidal new forms, in which case I don't have to explain them because you already know about them, or if you haven't seen them, a quick five minute introduction is really not going to do much good. And so I will focus instead on the Dirichlet characters and just say, by using more advanced number theory techniques, you can apply this to other families of L functions. So um, the main part of the talk, uh, justifying why I'm giving this and not just saying, well, I talked here in 2006, is that we can now use this to get better bounds for the order of vanishing of L functions at the central point. So for a lot of L functions, we believe that they will not vanish at the central point. Elliptic curve L functions you know, is a great system where we actually expect that there could be a lot of vanishing at the central point because of the butch to die conjecture. It is an open question as to how much vanishing can you have at the central point? I am old enough that I think I have seen a change in the consensus between uh, are there curves with arbitrarily high vanishing at the central point or is there a certain critical threshold beyond which there is no elliptic curve over Q that vanishes to that order or higher? And when I was a graduate student, I think people still believed you could get arbitrarily high rank. I think the consensus now is that you do not have arbitrarily high rank. And there are some good heuristic models explaining why this seems to be a maximum, which is just a little bit above the current world record. So everything is at least nice and consistent so far. So the general formulation of a lot of the problems I study is there is something that you're interested in, some events, T1, T2, T3, and you wanna figure out what rules govern the spacings between the Ts. And depending on who you're talking to, it could be energy levels of heavy nuclei, which is where a lot of the subject began. It could be eigenvalues of matrices. It could be zeros of L functions. Depending on which problem you're studying, you often have different techniques that allow you to make progress. But the general question is, I wanna understand how long do I have to wait before something interesting happens? Uh, for this talk, it would probably be about 30 minutes. All right, so the proofs rely on three basic ingredients. The first is you have to determine what is the correct scale to study for the event. The next is you need some kind of explicit formula relating what you want to study to something that you're able to study. And then the last is the explicit formula would be useless if you didn't have some kind of averaging formula to analyze what you've converted it to. And so rather than going through the calculations in great detail on the number theory side, I'm going to instead talk a little bit about classical random matrix theory, where it's a little bit easier to point to uh, what these different ingredients are and give you a sense of what's going on. I'll quickly go through the calculations for Dirichlet L functions, and then just say, you can do this for cuspidal uh, new forms as well. For other families of L functions on GL3 and higher, we don't have as good averaging formulas. And you know, for those of you who are looking for a really good hard project, you know, coming up with good averaging formulas over GLN would open up a lot and it would allow us to look at more interesting families than we're looking at now. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about classical random matrix theory. So I'm, I think the last person to migrate over to number theory questions like this from a nuclear physics background. So my mentor was one of the original experimentalists in the 1950s looking at energy levels of heavy nuclei. And he got frustrated over the fact that with you know, a tremendous amount of work, you might get between 100 and 1,000 observations Whereas if you looked at zeros of L functions, you can quickly get billions of zeros without that much work. And so I learned how to do number theory, not by taking any number theory classes as an undergraduate, but by working with a nuclear physicist who wanted to learn number theory. So if you think the Boston accent is hard to follow, um, you know, try listening to number theory from a physicist. So there will be a conversion table later to convert from physics speak to number theory speak, you know, similar to the ones the analysts and the probabilists have 
when they're talking about things. But I find the physics perspective is extremely valuable for trying to get a feel for what's going on and to try to understand the resulting calculations we're doing on the number theory side. So let me, Frank Furk, so a uh, wonderful, wonderful physicist. So the classical problem is, you know, if I have one point mass in the universe under gravity, no problem, two point masses under gravity, no problem, three point masses under gravity can no longer do it. So imagine how much worse the nuclear structure is going to be where you have over 200 protons and neutrons and a far more complicated force of interaction. One of the best quotes I ever heard to describe subatomic physics is the following. Imagine you want to understand how a grandfather clock works. And for those of you who are really young, these are the you know, big clocks that have your know, cogs. Money. So what you do is you take two grandfather clocks and you accelerate each one up to 0.99 speed of light, smash them together, look at all the stuff that comes out. And from that, you try to deduce how the grandfather clock works. This is subatomic physics. And to some extent, there is an analog of this in number theory. We don't use language like that. Uh, it might help with some of the funding proposals, but there is an analog to smashing things and seeing what comes out. And so what physicists do is they shoot um, high energy neutrons into the nucleus and they see what comes out. And they use to try to get a sense of the internal structure. So the fundamental equation is you have some Hamiltonian of the system, some matrix, and the energy eigenstates, these are the analogs of the eigenvectors, and the eigenvalues of the energy levels. So there's only two reasons why this is not normally done in a first class in linear algebra. The first is that the matrix H is infinite by infinite, not finite by finite. And normally in an intro to linear algebra, we only deal with finite size matrices. And the second complication is we don't know any of the entries of H. So we need to diagonalize an infinite by infinite matrix where you know zero entries. There's no way you're doing that. So Vigna's great insight was basically to say, you know, screw that. Let's go to statistical mechanics as a motivation. So let's say you want to calculate some macroscopic quantities such as pressure. So I want to see how many molecules are hitting a wall in a given amount of time, what's their speed, and use that to calculate. Well, the number of molecules in this room is way more than 10 to the 23rd. So there's no way we're going to write down this calculation exactly. So what you can do instead is let's look at every possible configuration of molecules in the room. And for each configuration, we can calculate what its pressure would be. And then let's calculate the system average. And then you hope some kind of central limit theorem kicks into play and that the average of all the configurations is pretty close to most configurations. And it turns out that that is a really good analog for what's going on. And so what Vigna said is, let's try to do the same thing for the Hamiltonian for this matrix. So rather than looking at the specific matrix for the specific nuclear structure we're looking at, let's just choose a bunch of matrices at random, calculate the eigenvalues for them, calculate the average properties of the distribution of these eigenvalues, and then say that the particular nucleus we care about should behave somewhat similar to the average. And there'll be analogs of this for zeros of L functions as well. And to be a little bit more explicit, the way the subject began is, let's say you look at real symmetric matrices and we'll choose the matrices so that the independent entries are drawn from say a fixed probability distribution. So the probability we choose the matrix A would be just the product of the probabilities of the independent entries, or just more explicitly, the probability I have a matrix A where AIJ is in a given interval would just be the integral of the probability density in that range, and then just take the product over all of them. And we wanna understand the eigenvalues of A. This is how the subject was classically done. Nowadays, we do it using Ha measure. And when you do Ha measure in the classical compact groups, there's now a very natural notion of, well, how do you choose a matrix at random? Well, you use the Ha measure to do it. In this one, you should be asking, well, why am I choosing one probability density as opposed to another? It turns out that there are some physical reasons why the most natural distribution to choose is a Gaussian. If you want your probability of your matrix to be invariant under orthogonal changes of variables, because the universe shouldn't care about how you orient your axes, then that actually forces P to be a Gaussian. But you can still play this game with any matrix. So how would we get our hands on the eigenvalues of A? Well, what we could do is we can take the Dirac delta functional, which is a point mass at X naught. So this is essentially uh, infinite density. So everything that's happening at the point X naught. So if we integrate a function F that's nice against the Dirac delta functional centered at X naught, it just returns the value of F at X naught. 
And so what we could do is given a matrix A, we'll put a mass of size one over M at each of the normalized eigenvalues. So we're gonna divide the eigenvalues by two square roots of M. So what matters here for the most part is the square root of N, that the eigenvalues of an N by N random matrix are growing like the square root of N. The two is so that we can say semi-circle later in the talk and not semi-ellipse. The two is not really important. It's the square root of N that's giving us the dependencies. And then what we can do is we can try to understand what's going on. Let's try to count how many normalized eigenvalues do we have in a given interval. Well, if I just integrate my density from A to B, it's just gonna count how many normalized eigenvalues do I have. If I wanna calculate the kth moment of that distribution, I just integrate X to the K and we'll see uh, very shortly that this is just the trace of A to the K. And this is coming from the eigenvalue trace lemma that well, if I put it next to the K, I'm going to just get a contribution uh, from the point mass at lambda I of A over two root N raised to the K power. Whoops, I gotta make sure I don't twist my hand at all. Sorry about that. And then the eigenvalue trace lemma says that the sum of the eigenvalues to the K power is the same as the trace of A to the K. This is one of the most important results in linear algebra, but when I first you know, took the class, I had no idea why this matters. The reason it matters is we want to understand the eigenvalues of the matrix. That's what tells us, you know, the energy levels that tells us what's really going on, but it's the matrix elements we choose. So this is a way to pass from what we want to understand, the eigenvalues, something that we can understand, the matrix elements. And there will be analogs of this in number theory. There'll be analogs of this explicit formula. And then the hope is that we can actually handle things involving the trace of A to the K. That's just going to be a nice polynomial. So it turns out that that won't be too bad to study. And then the last thing is, if you have a nice distribution, you would hope that if you know all the Taylor coefficients, you would hope that if you know all the moments, that that would uniquely determine the distribution. That is not the case. This is one of the reasons real analysis is such a difficult subject. But morally, what we're doing here is we're calculating the kth moments. And the hope is if you know the kth moments of your distribution, you know the distribution. So the first uh, main result we have is Vigna semicircle law which says if we take n by n real symmetric matrices, if we choose the entries independent identically distributed from a nice probability distribution, then the normalized eigenvalues converge essentially to a semicircle. And you know, the key ingredient in the proof, as I mentioned, is the eigenvalue trace lemma, which converts sums of the eigenvalue powers, which is the moments, to sums of products of the matrix elements. And now the hope is that we can calculate average values of these. All right, so I mentioned earlier that we're going to divide by two square roots of n. Where does that come from? Well, the trace of a squared is the sum of the eigenvalues squared. For real symmetric matrix, the eigenvalues are real. So lambda i squared is going to be a non-negative number. And so by the central limit theorem, if I look at the trace of a squared, I'm basically getting the sum of a i j squared. I'm choosing my a's to be mean zero variance one. You might as well adjust things to be nice, you know, recenter so that the mean is zero, rescale so that the variance is one. So aij squared is essentially just going to have average value of one. So that sum should be of size n squared. So the sum of the squares of the eigenvalues is about n squared. There are n of them. So each eigenvalue we would expect to be of size square root of n. So this gives you a sense of what is the correct scale to study. When you're looking at zeros of L functions, if you're near the central point or if you're very high up on the critical line, you get very different renormalizations that you should be using. And so now all we have to do is you know, calculate these average values. And then this is where things are difficult. So you have to first do the calculation and then you have to somehow control the variance and say that most things are close to the average value. And so this is where my advisors would say, now you do some abstract nonsense and just so that everything works out as you would expect. You know, the main meat of the calculation is to calculate what is the mean value and show that it agrees with the moments of the semicircle. Uh, to give you a extremely misleading picture of how you would do the calculation, if we tried to calculate the second moment, we would be calculating the sum of aj i squared, where we would split that one off and we would have all the other ones over here. I'm just integrating a probability density that's just one. This is the second moment of something with mean zero, so that's just one. So it doesn't look like it's that bad. It actually gets a little bit worse when you start looking at the higher moments and you start having you know, polynomials in here. If you're looking at real symmetric moments, the Catalan numbers come into play in terms of the number of ways you can match. There's a lot of beautiful geometric interpretations and things that you can do. 
But the main point I want you to get out of this is that for random matrix theory, we can do these calculations. It involves just elementary integration, it involves elementary combinatorics. We get wonderful results. It is not going to be that way for number theory. And so what I want to do is just briefly make sure we're all on the same page with some number theory concepts, then go into Dirichlet characters, and then talk about the new results on bounding order vanishing. Right. So hopefully everybody has seen the Riemann zeta function. You can define it as the sum over the integers or the product over primes. And the idea is that because it can be written as a product over primes, the hope is that by understanding the sum over integers, we can use this to get information about the product over primes. It satisfies a functional equation. If you put in some you know, simple factors, its value at s is related to its value at 1 minus s. It satisfies the Riemann hypothesis. All the non-trivial zeros have real part of half. There are zeros of the negative even integers. I know it satisfies the Riemann hypothesis because as the editor of the Journal of Number Theory, I get at least one proof every week, sometimes two, of the Riemann hypothesis. Uh, occasionally, we do get disproofs, but we get more proofs than disproofs, so I'm pretty sure that it's true just by law of large numbers. And the main observation is that it turns out when you look high up on the critical line, the spacings between zeros of the Riemann zeta function seem to obey the same law as the spacings between eigenvalues of complex emission matrices. So this was a remarkable discovery when it first came out. Now, instead of looking at the Riemann zeta function, I can replace the one over n to the s with you know, some coefficients af of n. And you can put anything you want there. The question is, when will you put something that's useful? Well, if it turns out that I still have a product representation and the AFs come from something of number theoretic interest, this turns out to be a very good thing to do. And so there are lots of choices of AFs that you can put that will lead to objects that encode information that we care about. It also satisfies a functional equation. We believe the Riemann hypothesis is true. We really haven't gotten too many proofs of that. So it might just be for just the zeta function, but um, we do expect that with this normalization, all the non-trivial zeros will still have real part one half. And the spacings between its zeros also appear to look the same as complex Hermitian matrices. All right, so you know, what do I mean by this? Well, here is a beautiful picture from Odlisco looking at 70 million adjacent zeros starting at the 10 to the 20th zero. And it's remarkable the agreement you have between the you know, spacings between zeros. You know, how often are you the average spacing? How often are you twice the average spacing? And just incredible agreement between random matrix theory and number theory. So the question is, you know, why is there such agreement between two very different subjects? The calculations are completely different, but they seem to be having the same behavior. And so there's a lot of conversations you could have about where is this universality coming from in number theory? Uh, given that this is a 50 minute talk, I'm not gonna really get into too much of that, but you're know, happy to chat further about where this is coming from. All right, uh, so how are we able to do these calculations? So, if you take a complex analysis, one of the things that is drilled into you, or at least it is if you have a good instructor, is that you should always take the logarithmic derivative and do a contour integral. And whenever you see a product, you should have a Pavlovian response that you should always take a logarithm whenever you have a product, because we have numerous methods to evaluate sums. We don't really understand or process products. Now again, the log doesn't really do much. You know, it's just a conversion. But in complex analysis, the logarithmic derivative becomes zeta prime over zeta. And now when we do a contour integral of that, that's gonna pull out information from the zeros. So the nice thing is the log of a product is the sum of the logs. So now if we take the derivative, you know, term by term, and you know, again, I'm not gonna worry about proving convergence, we get, you know, the following, and then we have a geometric series that we can expand out. And so as long as we're in a place where everything converges, I can isolate the first term, and then there's everything else. And then you just show that everything else is well-behaved, and that most of the behavior is going to be coming from the first term over here. So now I hit zeta prime over zeta with a test function and I integrate. So I integrate x to the s over s. And as I do my contour integral shift, I'm gonna get a contribution every time I hit a zero or a pole of this. And this is one way to see you know, the proof of the prime number theorem. The main term that's gonna come out is gonna come out from the pole of zeta at s equals one. That's gonna give me an x to the first power. If the Riemann hypothesis is true, all the zeros have real part one half, so that'll give you lower order terms of size x to the one half. So the left-hand side is going to give me something involving zeros of the zeta function. And then on the right-hand side over here, this is a fun integral to do. Uh, it turns out that that integral is going to be one if p is less than x, 
and it's going to be zero if p is greater than x. So it's going to basically just detect all the primes up to x, and it's going to count how many primes there are up to x by weighting the primes by log p. But we don't have to integrate against x to the s of s. I could put in a different test function. I could put in phi of s. And when I do this integral now and I pull this over, I'm going to get contributions from the zeros and the poles, but I'll have phi evaluated them. And I'll have your phi of s, p to the negative s. Well, we write s as you know, sigma plus i t. We can write uh, p to the s as e to the log p. And you see what is over here is this looks like the Fourier transform of a nice modification of phi. So this is going to be our analog of the explicit formula. On the left-hand side, we're going to get a sum of phi over the zeros. On the right-hand side, we're going to get a sum of phi hat uh, at the primes. And so to just write it explicitly, you know, for the Riemann zeta function, we would get something that looks like this. You know, sum over zeros is related to this is coming from the pole, and then everything else is coming from the primes. If I look at uh, Dirichlet L functions, I get a slightly different explicit formula. Uh, where chi of p is basically what I was calling the AFN before. So we'll talk a little bit more about those shortly. But the idea is this is the analog of the eigenvalue trace lemma. And it's going to be very tractable computations. I'll skip the cusp of new forms. And then just briefly about the different kinds of statistics one can look at. So the first statistic was the n-level correlation. It was looking at how often are uh, you know, tuples of differences of zeros in a given box. So the simplest one to think about is the two-level correlation how often is the difference of two zeros in a fixed interval? Well, we then divide that by, you know, we look at all the indices up to n, divide by n, and as n goes to infinity, you realize that you can throw away finitely many zeros without affecting the limiting behavior. So the spacings between, you know, as you go higher and higher up, you know, the zeros become you know, more and more dense, but they're still moving further and further away. So if you throw away finitely many zeros at the central point, s equals one half, it's not gonna affect these limiting calculations. So unfortunately, when you look at statistics like the n-level correlation, it's insensitive to finitely many zeros. If you wanna look at spacings between adjacent zeros, it turns out by combinatorics, if you know all the n-level correlations, you can then pass to the spacings between adjacent zeros. And yes. Uh, it, it, uh, it's implicit that the indices are only going up to n. Yes. And so we're only looking at the indices up to capital M. Uh, of course, if you really wanted to do these calculations, you would never, ever, ever calculate something like this because this is a sharp cutoff. You would always put in a nice, smooth you know, cutoff function and then make the analyst in you happy. And so just a quick summary of results uh, between random matrix theory and number theory, the normalized spacings of zeta s starting at 10 to the 20th, we saw agreed with random matrix theory. Montgomery proved the two-level correlation, and then Dennis Hedgel proved the three-level correlations of the zeta function agree with random matrix theory. And then right around the time Hedgel did that, Rudnick and Sonic proved not just the two or three-level, but the n-level correlation, not just for zeta, but for all automorphic cuspidal L functions agree. Then we have the interesting result that Katz and Sonic showed that the n-level correlations for all the classical compact groups agree. And we have the idea that these quantities are insensitive to finitely many zeros. If you care about things like elliptic curves and the birch swinton diet conjecture, well, all the action is happening at the central point and this misses what's going on. So what might be happening is that if you go high enough on the center, on the critical line, all the L functions are behaving similarly, but they could behave very differently near the central point. And so we want a new statistic that can pull out what's going on near the central point. And so this is where the n-level density comes into play. And so what you do is you take your L function f, uh, you take some test function phi. For simplicity, I'm gonna write it as a product of test functions, but you could of course consider something more general. I have some kind of local rescaling near the central point, which is gonna depend on the conductor, which is gonna come from the functional equation. And I'm gonna look at this product over zeros. And what's nice now is because phi is a Schwartz test function with rapid decay, most of the contribution is gonna come from the zeros near the central point. Now, unfortunately, if we looked at one L function, we go really high up on the critical line, the number of zeros, the density is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So you get a tremendous number of zeros to average over. There's only a few zeros near the central point. And so we don't have enough to really isolate anything for one L function. So I can't really tell you what's going on for one L function, but what I can do is I can bundle a lot of L functions together into a family and then I can average over the family. And again, we need some kind of averaging to happen. 
And if we do that, the hope is that we can have a result. And the result is the cationic density conjecture, which says for a nice family of L functions, the n-level density depends only on a symmetry group attached to the family. So if I give you cuspal new forms that are even, that will have one limiting behavior. If I give you cuspal new forms that are odd, it will have another. If I give you Dirichlet L functions of a say prime conductor, that might be something else. That there's different behavior you can see now in different families of L functions near the central point. And so the idea is, you know, as we take the limit as our parameter goes to infinity, it could be the level of the cusp forms, it could be the conductor, the Dirichlet characters that this should converge to integrating our test function against some function specific to whatever's going on. And the idea is we now have a way that relates sums over zeros on the left-hand side, which we might care about, to you know, some integrals that no longer have any number theory. And we can now try to apply functional analysis to understand what these integrals are and then use that to deduce things about the zeros. All right, so I promised I would give you a conversion between physics and number theory. So in physics, you study energy levels. In number theory, you study zeros. In physics, you shoot in a neutron. In number theory, you shoot in a Schwartz test function. In physics, you could only shoot neutrons of a given energy band. In number theory, that turns out to be the support of the test function, where the function is non-zero. We would love to shoot a Schwartz test function of arbitrary support. In fact, we'd like to take an approximation to the delta spike, because then that would tell us what's going on at the central point. We can't do that. Uh, it, re it, resu it results in having to calculate sums over all primes. And so we can only calculate the sums over primes in restricted intervals. And so because of that, we are limited in terms of which calculations we can do, which means we're limited in terms of the information we can get. Uh, one of my advisors, Henrik Ivanyets, once remarked that there are a lot of results about you know, how many zeros can you have off the line of the zeta function up to a certain height that can be interpreted as I can give you a better bound on the cardinality of the empty set. You know, I can show you the empty set has at most this many elements. And so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get information about what's going on at the central point. We're not able to get what we know is true, but we try to get the best we can with the resulting sums that we can evaluate. So the better you can evaluate these sums, the better support you have, the better results you can get. All right, so uh, one of the applications of this is we can use this to bound the order of vanishing. And so, actually, I'll go back one slide. So, if I take my sum over all the zeros, if I take my function phi to be non negative, if I throw away every zero that's not at the central point, I just make the left hand side smaller. So, the left hand side is clearly going to be larger than the average rank times phi of zero. And so, then that will be less than equal to my integral. So, I can actually use this to get results. And so, uh, with Chris Hughes, you know, I applied this to the n-level density for cuspal new forms, and we were able to show for any n, the percent of curves that vanish to rank at least r is some constant depending on n times r to the minus n. So it's decaying with r. And the higher rank you have that you want to say, I want to know how many curves vanish to order at least five, at least six, at least seven, the higher number you take, the, the better decay you get. The problem is the constant Cn grows so if you want to use the two level or the three level or the four level, you have to go deeper down before it becomes useful. So for example, the first result I got was at most something like 250% of the forms in the family vanished to rank at least this much. There's easier ways to prove that at most 250% of the time something happens than going through all of these calculations. But eventually the results do become useful. All right, so what I want to do is I've got, I think about 15 minutes left. And so what I want to do is quickly show you how to do these calculations for Dirichlet L functions. I'm not going to do these slides for the cuspidal new forms. Uh, the slides are online. And so if anybody wants to, you can look at them there or just shoot me an email. Let's do a calculation where you can hopefully understand all the number theory that's going on. So um, while I did take complex analysis as an undergraduate, I never took abstract algebra or group theory. So I do apologize for any mistakes. But we have a cyclic group of order m minus one. It has a generator. We can explicitly write down what the characters are. Uh, and so as long as you can figure out what's going on at the generator, you know what's going on everywhere. I'm choosing m to be a prime. So the you know, group is going to be uh, cyclic. And then we can explicitly write down what every character is. All I need to do is figure out what does it do to the generator. And I know exactly how many different choices there are. So I'm gonna go through this a little quickly. We can write everything down very explicitly. I can write down, you know, here's my L function. 
I can write it as a product over primes. I can write it as a sum. Um, and then I have a functional equation and there's you know, a little bit of a change depending on what is the value of a pi of minus one. But again, I have something that relates values at s to values at one minus s. I have a explicit formula which relates sums over zeros to sums over primes. So I've got the sums over primes and the squares of primes and the cubes of primes, fourth powers of primes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But because of the increasing power of, uh, where is it? The prime, it goes p to the minus one half, p to the minus one, p to the minus three halves. You see, once we get to prime cubes and higher, I can just take all of them together and they just become a lower order error term. And I just have to understand the sums over primes and prime squares. All right, and so just you know, writing everything down explicitly, I now take the sum over all the characters in the family. And because all of the Dirichlet L functions have the same uh, essentially functional equation, they all have the same character, I can conduct, I can pass the sum on the characters through the test function to the coefficients here. And I just need to understand sums of Dirichlet characters. So if you remember your orthogonality relationships, we actually have really good formulas for this. We have the sum of you know, chi of k over all chi is m minus one. If k is one mod m and zero otherwise, well, I'm not using the principal character, so I just have to subtract one because I don't have its contribution. I then just feed this into my formula, and now I can just calculate what these sums are for the sums over primes. And so you know, when I put this in, I'll have two different terms that I have to study. Um, the first one, I have a one over m minus two. I have a sum over primes. As long as m to the sigma, sigma is my support. So my test function is zero outside of minus sigma to the sigma. So once p is larger than m to the sigma, phi hat vanishes. So I only have to sum primes up to m to the sigma. This is where that support restriction comes in. I only have to study primes up to a certain point. And when I put this in now, I can see, okay, well, the sum of you know, p to the minus one half, and you know, I've got a lot of people, that, yeah, just call it sum over all n to the minus one half, that's gonna be like n to the one half. So it's gonna be like n to the sigma over two. As long as sigma is less than two, the first term is gonna be small because I'm dividing by m. So as long as sigma is less than two, m to the sigma over two will be smaller than m. For the second term, uh, unfortunately I have a big contribution, but the primes have to be congruent to one mod m. And the smallest prime that can be congruent to one mod m is, how small can the smallest prime be that's one mod m? m plus one. So I know that the very first term that comes in can't be too small. And so even though I do have, you know, I don't have my m decay outside because the first prime has to be at least m plus one, that's also gonna be small. And so, you know, I'm not gonna go through all the details of the calculation, but morally that's you know, essentially what goes on. Um, if you look at the sums over prime squares, it's, it's pretty similar. Um, people often have conversations about how should you normalize your tech? Um, how should you normalize your Fourier transform? And I just you know had a conversation with him. You know, he wants the one over two pi hours one in the exponent. The other question you can ask is which template should you use? The Dom shot because I can just click on the dots and just move and completely over the cuspidal section. So what I want to do is for the last ten minutes is talk about applications of bound order of vanishing. So there are three ways we can try the results. One is we can try to increase the level of support for the one level. And so the world record of new forms is going up to minus two. Dirichlet minus two, two, that's the best we can do. I'll say unconditionally in quotes and assumes the Riemann hypothesis, the anti, for, the anti for plane, that's not a big deal. If you even stronger than the Riemann hypothesis, you can often push things a little bit further. L functions, we can go up to minus many as you want to. Another thing you could do is you could try a test function. Is you know average rank times phi of zero integral. Well, what's the best choice of that's another avenue you can do, and I've done that with and then the other one is to use the n-level density. If you use the n-level densities, it gives you results in the beginning, but eventually. Eventually, I'll start kicking in the query and what focus today on the last one on some of your recent results I've done with some students. And so, there's you know a bunch of uh, papers we have over the years about you know trying to uh, do better jobs optimizing, doing better jobs determining optimal function, trying to increase the support. 
And you know, a lot of this is you know very technical in terms of trying to increase the support, but we have gotten the support for custom new forms up to much too. So we've been able to do it without introducing you know, stronger conjectures. Talk to using the four level density. And then trying to been finished. Right. So there's always a a battle between writing something that a human can read and getting the best results possible. It's the Osanic note in the classic paper on the subject is if you use the naive test function, which is you know very easy to work with, you actually get pretty good results that are close to optimal and they're very easy to work with. And you know, I'll show exactly how close in a moment. This is the test function that's optimal. It's a little bit blurry, but you know what? That's probably not a bad thing. You shouldn't really be looking at odd. Oh, it's like the installment plan is it slowly starts to, you know, this is a lot worse than the uh, naive test function, but you can do the integrals without too much trouble. Worst case, you know, there are packages that do stuff like this. For the end level, trying to use stuff like this does lead to some interesting contour integrals. And you know, it was a little bit of a challenge you know, getting the uh, contours to work out and getting everything to be nice. Right. So let me just briefly review how you would get bounds like this. So we talk about the one level density. So we sum our test function phi at the scaled zeros. We then sum over all the forms in the family, and then we divide by the size of the family. And then what we can do is if we take, as I said, our test function to be non-negative, then if I drop all the zeros that are at the central point, I'm only making the sum over zeros smaller. And then that's going to be less than or equal to some integral. And so I just choose the phi that makes this as small as possible. And then that will give me the best bound. And this will give me a one over R decay. And this is very easy to work with if we're just doing the one level density. If we try to do the two level density, it gets a little bit worse. We'll see that in a moment. So I mentioned that the optimal test function is not that much better. How much not better? Well, if I try to do order of vanishing 20, the naive test function gives 0 0.04375, the optimal 0 0.0432. So the improvement is not that much. Interestingly, for some of the higher level n, the naive test function actually does better than the optimal for the one level. It's not clear what the optimal is for the n level. This is another you know, ongoing project. We have some results for the two level. There's lots of technical games you can play if anybody's interested. There are a lot of projects in this area. But the, the gain we're getting by going to the optimal test function is not tremendous in what these numbers are. So in terms of if you have a finite amount of research time, which is going to be the most productive, optimizing the test function is not really giving you that much of a gain. But it is giving you a gain. All right, so with one of my students, Stella Lee, we looked at you know, what can we do from the four level and I don't want to go into you know, too much detail about all the calculations and the comparisons and what's going on. I just want to hopefully have this non blurry for a moment so you can just see that the two level and the four level start to do a lot better than the one level bounds. It's almost like the old train station, what's flipping in. Okay, so you can see like the one level gives order vanishing for six. At, you know, 0.144 as the upper bound, the two level gives 0 0.015, much better. And the fourth sentence gives 0 0.008, even better still by a good amount. When you get up to 20, you can see you're going from, you know, about 0 0.02 for the one level to 0 0.00015 for the two to, you know, seven times 10 to the negative eight for the four. But again, you know, as in the joke I just mentioned, these are bounds, these are upper bounds on the number zero. You know, we believe for cuspal new forms, you know, in the limit, you know, if you have an even family, you know, there's zero percent advantage to rank greater than zero. If you have an odd family, there's zero percent advantage to rank greater than one. So you know, while these bounds are better, they're really just bounds on zero. All right. So if we want to calculate bounds using the n-level density, we need to know what is the n-level density. And so this is just explicitly writing down what it is. My you know, students from you know, small, uh, I guess it was last summer, you know, finally finished all the proofs and all the difficult combinatorics to determine 
what is the m level density we have explicit formulas we have every integral that we could possibly need you can see that this is not going to be a fun integral to work with but you know it should be something doable in terms of signs and stuff like this we should be able to put in exponentials and do some kind of contour integral and get results from this if not for fixed n we can at least uh numerically approximate all right and so what we want to do is we want to try to figure out what's going on it turns out it's technically easier to study the centered moments rather than the n-level densities by doing combinatorics, you can pass from one to the other without any real trouble. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take our sum over zeros and we're going to subtract off essentially the mean. And then we're going to raise that to the nth power. We're going to average over the family and it just converges to something nice. And the main term, the mean is actually very easy to calculate. Technically, what we should be doing is we shouldn't be using the limit of the means. We should be using the mean for the finite level in which we're doing it. But you can show by the binomial theorem in Cauchy Schwartz that if you replace the mean up to level n with the mean as n goes to infinity, the error is so small that it doesn't really matter. And you can just have this easier quantity to look at. All right. So the theorem that my student Duda and I proved is that as long as r is greater than the mean divided by phi of zero, then the probability you vanish to order r or higher in the family and the limit is bounded by this quantity. And so we can use this to now get you know, much better results on bounding order vanishing in families. You know, we did this for the most part for families of cuspal new forms, but these arguments carry out for basically any family of L functions that you want to look at. The main thing is we now have so, certain integrals we need to do, and those integrals give us balance. And it just the question is, what is the support we can use? What test functions can we use? Well, that's where you need the number theory. If I have support up to minus two, two, I can use these functions. If I have support up to minus four, four, I can use these functions. And so how do we prove this? Um, hopefully this will stabilize you know, in the last minute so that you can see. So I want to look at a sum over zeros. And I'm going to break the zeros into two parts. There's the zeros at the central point, And then there's all the other contributions. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just look at the forms in my family that have at least r zeros at the central point. So that'll be the r phi of zero piece. And then I have all the other zeros and then I'm subtracting off the mean. Well, the problem is I'm raising this to the nth power. If n is even, if I drop any forms, I'm not dropping a negative number. So I'm only gonna make things smaller, which is good. The problem is if the sum over all the zeros that are not at the central point plus r phi of zero is less than the mean, if I drop the zeros that are not at the central point, I could actually make the thing in parentheses bigger. And that's why the bounds you get for the n-level density, they only kick in once r is sufficiently large that r phi of zero is greater than the mean. Because if r phi of zero was less than the mean, when I throw away all the zeros, I might actually have made things even smaller. And since this quantity was a negative number, by making it even more negative, I've actually made it larger. But once I know that what's inside the parentheses is positive, then if I throw away things, I only make it larger. So that's why we need to have our at least a certain size. And when we do that, if we drop everything else, we're going to get an upper bound. And now over here, I can just divide this quantity over and I will get a bound for the percent of forms in a family that vanish to a given order. And it then just comes down to what is the best fee I can choose to make this as small as possible. And so if we go up to, two over n, uh, which we can do for families of cuspal new forms. Um, hopefully you can at least see while it's localizing that you're beginning to get exponents over here. So it's got to be better bounds. And just trying to get a sense of just how much better. Um, so I can read it. So you know, if we're looking at bounding to order four, using the one level, we get 0.21, using the fourth centered moment. Actually, I think I have to read my classes. Uh, using the fourth moment, you get 0.07. And using the sixth moment, it's too soon to say. The sixth moment is not able to you know, give a bound yet because of the relative sizes. But if you get to the eighth moment, you, know, you go from you know, 0.1 for the first moment to 0.009 for the second moment, so about a factor of 10 better, to 0.0004 for the third, and then 0 0.000068. So it gets much, much better as you go further and further. You know, I, I apologize that this is not projecting well. Um, 
So I'm going to skip the next slide. I'll go to this slide because the numbers here are hopefully big enough that they will show without any trouble. Um, in fact, I don't even need my glasses for this one. So what we did here is for each n, we just wrote what is the best bound we can get using any level. And you can see, you know, we get much better results on the bounding of you know, the of zero as we go further and further down. So by the time we get to 20, we have a bound of you know, essentially 10 to the negative 16. But even for vanishing to order four, we're now getting 0 0.06 for vanishing of order 8.005. So the end level density gives you much better results much less, with much less work. So thank you.